This topic is not really advanced, but it's not something you should stress about if you are a beginner. It's advanced relatively to the rest of the course. The fun fact about error handling is that nobody has figured it out, not just in functional programming. I change my mind every year, sometimes a few times a day. Regardless, we'll talk about errors, where to find them, what works and what not, and then we'll review two techniques I've been using recently and still don't hate them. First, what do we mean by errors, exceptions or failures? Instead of definitions, let's look at their causes, severity and usage. An error in the runtime is either a programming mistake or an actual error, some exceptional behavior outside of the happy path. Whenever you have a code or behavior that should never happen, but one day it does, it's a programmer mistake. If some function has an invariant or precondition like the list of orders should be sorted, the principal amount should not be negative or the date should not be from the future and it gets violated, it's a programming mistake. Arguably, even something extraordinary like stack overflow or out of memory happens, it's still a programming mistake. Someone didn't build or orchestrate the service or application properly. These errors are not something we want to correct or react to. These are something we should prevent in the first place. Remember when we talked about getting the first element or the sum of an empty list? Having an explicit non-empty list prevents us from even trying that. But if we cannot prevent this, using precise types, tools or code reviews, we should crash the program as soon as possible, using whatever the language provides. We should not continue with inconsistent and potentially dangerous state or data. For example, we like how Unison provides a function called bug that aborts the program, which makes the intention more clear. Yes, sometimes it's easier and cleaner to leave a good comment instead of overcomplicating and overdefending the code. Trade-offs. Classic errors come from the external world, outside of the programmer's control. Imagine reading from a file or a database. If a file does not exist or a database is not reachable, we should handle this failure because there isn't much we can do to prevent this. The line between the two is not always clean. Imagine we have a contract with another team and one day they send us a JSON with an unexpected empty list. Is treating this empty list as non-empty list a programming mistake or an actual error or exception? Not easy to tell. We can also look at errors or failures from another, more controversial perspective based on their severity. Some are recoverable and some are not recoverable. If you're reading some data from a file and it's empty, this might be recoverable. For example, we can have a fallback data, a code pass for missing data, or alternative source of data. But if we are failing to read the file we just wrote to, the file storage is unreachable or the connection is unstable, there is nothing we can do. These exceptions are non-recoverable. Same for the differences between an empty database result set and a database being unreachable. If we don't read this as a programming error, an error like stack overflow or out of memory is very much non-recoverable. The line between the recoverable and not is even blurrier, because even a crucial missing file can have a fallback or backup logic. So it might be more valuable to look at the error purpose. Sometimes we use errors for control flow when we decide what to do. Otherwise, we report them. And if there is nothing we can do about them, either throw them away or crash the app. When we write code that does something depending on the failure, we want to know exactly what happened. So for control flow, we want to have explicit proper types. For example, in the case of reading the file, we might want to distinguish between missing and empty files and include different contexts. Then we can decide if the file is missing, regenerate it or fail, if it's empty, use some some default value and so on. Saying that we use errors and exceptions for control flow is also controversial and it doesn't help that errors and exceptions are different across languages. Hold it, we'll talk about it more later. Otherwise, if the situation is truly exceptional, we want to report it so we or our system can react right away or do something to let us investigate it later. In this case, another error differentiator is their error's final consumer, the programmers or external users. If it's an actual failure, programmers should get as much context as possible. We have access to the internals and are the ones who have to deal with this. So make it easier for our future selves. Make logs, traces, metrics or whatever we can. If there is nothing a developer needs to manually do and the infrastructure or the try mechanism take care of the error, maybe bumping and error counter is enough. No need to spam the logs. If the error happens at the edge of the program or gets propagated there, we should only report the minimum required information for them to retry and optionally adjust their behavior. The user doesn't need to know that our database is not doing well, but they need to know if they provided a malform input and need to fix it. And we shouldn't forget that there is a difference between a human interacting with our programs manually and programmatically via APIs. If we squint, we can say that 
that we are using recoverable errors for control flow and not recoverable errors for reports. However, some recoverable errors are too innocent or neutral or even useless and don't really affect the control flow. For example, if we know that we are dealing with questionable data sources with rare useless samples of full of nulls and trash data, we might want to just log and skip it and keep doing what we are doing. If you have logs full of warnings that nobody ever looks at, you know what I mean. Also, there are some not recoverable errors that you cannot report. Like if you're already out of memory, you don't have the luxury of making a pretty error report. All of this in mind, the next question is, how do we encode or model errors in the code? It certainly differs from language to language, but there are two main ways. With typed errors, when we use proper types and values to model errors, and with exceptions, when errors don't appear in the types and we use a built-in exception mechanisms. This is not really standardized terminology, just something we use here for convenience and labeling. There are different variations and syntaxes around these techniques. But it's mainly come down to the trade-off between being safe and explicit versus being ergonomic, easy to use. Let's see what that means. We talked a lot about typed errors in other lessons, but here are a few reminders. We can use optional to model missing values. For example, a function that extracts an integer from the string can return an optional integer because not every string contains an integer. Or we can use result or either to model more cases of failure. For example, we can have a result with variants like OK with the content of the file, error with a missing file name, or error with an empty file. And we have to handle all the cases, and so on. When we use typed errors, the type system tells us which cases we need to handle. We don't need to worry about missing errors or handling errors we already handled. The annoying problem with typed errors is composition. When we end up with more than one error in one function, we have to deal with all of them. It's like when we talked about parsing integers and doing division. The parsing can fail with parse integer error and the division can fail with division error. The question is, what the broken div function can fail with? Both, either, and how do we express this? Last time we avoid the question and simply converted each error to a string. This technically solves the problem, the result becomes result of an integer or a string, but then we sacrifice all the error information. A string is hard to use for control flow as well as for reporting. We can use union types or something similar like polymorphic variants, which is less annoying but less supported. With union types, specifying the common type is as easy as saying that parse integer error or division error. But when that is not an option, we can make custom hierarchies of errors using ADTs. This shouldn't be anything new, we're just building on top what we already have. The new result is going to be integer or my division error, which in includes parsing error, diff errors, and other errors, and so on. Some people prefer multiple hierarchies and converting between them. Others prefer one hierarchy for the whole app. We don't need to go into more details now. Making all the hierarchies could be boring, verbose, and clumsy. Because many languages come with some extensible exception mechanism, we can use this main root or parent exception as a common denominator. It could be throwable, some exception, error, or whatever. This kind of composition can destroy the specifics of an error and lose the whole point of type errors. Exceptions or untyped errors, on the other hand, do not appear in types, which is their strengths and weakness. It is easier to compose functions with exceptions because we don't even see the errors. At the same time, it's easy to forget to handle them. When you catch exceptions, you have to know what to catch. Otherwise, you get something generic like throwable, some exception, or error we just mentioned. It's also easy to implement handlers for errors that never happen and errors that have already been handled. The type system can help you much. Note for Scala developers and alike, when we talk about exception, we also mean exception as part of IO or task. The nice thing about exception is that we can focus on the happy path of the program, which is nice, but dangerous. Ah, it's one of those, hopefully the caller doesn't forget to handle all the errors for me, right? When it comes to performance, there are two camps. One says that using exception is good for performance, because they can be compiled into efficient machine code. The other says that exceptions are expensive and should not be used for control flow, because walking the stack and making stack traces is not free. There is truth to both of this, especially because the context and languages are different. If you care about performance, you should probably do benchmarks and don't listen to people on the internet. What's definitely not the best for performance is using both typed errors and exceptions at the same time. We've covered this in the previous lessons, but it makes sense to revisit it after everything we've just learned. For example, when we have IO of result, we have two error channels. We must handle both type errors in result and exceptions in IO. 
Doing this occasionally and in specific situation is fine, but doing this all the time means you have to deal with the shortcomings of both approaches. Also note that there are libraries and concepts that try to find a compromise, something in between two approaches. If you're interested, a few starting points are effects, abilities and by functor IO. To wrap it all up, we want to share two concrete error handling patterns or ways to tame errors in your app. And in both cases, our first rule of thumb is either to deal with programming mistakes using the technique we covered in the rest of the course or make the program crash. So first approach, we use exceptions or untyped errors only for exceptional behavior and situation. For example, stack overflow, out of memory, file system failures, unreachable databases, and so on. Because there is nothing we can do in any of these cases, we don't need to track and distinguish between these errors or different exceptions. This allows us to catch and report or throw away all the exceptions only once on the highest level, the HTTP request handler, main application loop, or other entry points. If there are any other failures, they're not exceptional. We handle them and use a control flow. We track this using proper types and values, result, optional, custom EDTs, whichever one fits as we discussed in the previous lesson. And we keep in mind what information is needed for reporting versus control flow. The problem with this approach is a poor composition of typed errors, as we've seen before. If this is rare, then it's manageable. Otherwise, it's really annoying. So the second approach deals with the type error composition problem by relying on the fact that it's quite easy to convert between type errors and exceptions. Imagine we have a simple HTTP server. It gets a request with some input, get something out of a database, does some data aggregations, and returns a response. On the lowest level, one of the edges of the server is a function that interacts with the database. We know that we interact with the outside world. We know that database requests might fail, so the exceptions are unavoidable. We can leave the exception B here because it's part of the business logic to decide what to do about database failures, whether it's part of the control flow or exceptional behaviors that must be reported. There is still room for creativity on this level. Sometimes it might be useful to rearrange or regroup the errors still keep the exceptions outside of the types, but separate the recoverable errors from non-recoverable to make it easier for the callers, or maybe wrap those in a custom exception like MyDB exception, because keeping low-level exceptions can be an encapsulation leak. Another common thing to do is to make optionality explicit. For example, if we know that the user might be missing or not found, we can make it explicit and easier for the callers. They might want to care about missing customer info, but don't care about any other exceptions because they cannot do anything. On the middle level, where we have most of the business logic, we want explicit and typed errors. We don't want to miss any errors from the lower level, and we don't want the higher level to miss any errors as well. The trick here is to use exceptions for composition and convert unhandled exceptions to typed errors to pass them along, because typed errors are better for contract and being explicit. Let's look at the concrete pseudocode example. We just saw that the get customer returns optional customer info and can throw exceptions. Because there is nothing we can do about database errors, we just wrap it in a custom something went wrong error. This way we keep the error details for debugging needs and at the same time signal to the callers of the function that there is nothing specific they can do or worry about. Note that we can also convert errors to another hierarchy in the absence of union types or skip the conversion if we did all the exception modification on the lower level or didn't need any modification at all. Because we cannot compose options with other types of failures, in this case exceptions, we convert option into exception. None becomes not found user and some customer ID just stays a customer ID. We would do the same for any other failure. Then we take last order ID from customer info and fetch the order details from the other service. In this example, we know that the order service can fail to return order info and we don't care. That's why in case of any error, we default to an empty list. The last thing we do is some calculations or aggregations on the items that return an integer and convert exceptions to typed errors. Note that it makes use of union types. The result is either an integer or one of the failures we explicitly specified in this function. There is no other exception the function can throw. Well, Technically, we cannot guarantee that the ex function has no exceptions, but in this case, we handle all the exceptions from each function. So if some exception still happens, we have a programming mistake. Because we wanted to show everything in one snippet, it might seem like error handling takes up too much space. Remember, it's a tutorial. At the highest level, the other edge of the program, we don't want to miss any errors. Because we've done all the ground work on the lower levels, the only thing left to do is to convert all the errors into final reports. HTTP responses with proper 
proper bodies and status codes, locks for developers, and so on. It should all be explicit and simple at this point. We convert invalid input to bad requests. There is nothing for developers to care about. Maybe in case of not found user, we want to leave a debug message just in case, but return not found to the user with the message that was there. In case of something went wrong and we have an internal error, we probably want to error and put as much information as possible, but at the same time convert it to a beautiful, nice, simple message for our users. And if we have OK body, there's also nothing for developers to care about. So we just return 200 with a body. Note that we can write and reuse only one error handling for all the errors or have specific handlers for specific cases, whatever we prefer. So might sound silly, but we should try to avoid programming mistakes in the first place, using proper types, for example. We should be cautious if we use errors for control flow or reporting, and we should find balance between typed errors and exceptions. Exceptions are easy to compose, but have no contract and are easy to forget about. Every team does it differently. If you are just starting at a new job, Start by doing what they do and later try to improve. Or if you're working on a pet project, play around and see what works and what doesn't. Learn more about Happy Path programming and make functional programming click by joining how to think like a functional programmer. Or go write some code. Or do whatever you want.